Hello and uh, uh, welcome. Greetings to everyone out there in the digital Zoom ether. Uh, I am Paul Lewis, president of the Architectural League, and I'm very pleased to introduce the two emerging voices tonight, Low Design Office and Kunkui Design Initiative. Before the intros, I need to acknowledge that the Architectural League's programs are supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and by the League's members, many of you in the audience. Uh, and additional support for the series is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the Next Generation Fund of the Architectural League, which is an annual fund supported by a group of past emerging voices and League Prize winners. And a huge thank you goes out to our pr uh, principal supporters, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown. And this uh, program is also indebted to the League's uh, program director, Ann Rieselbach, program manager, Katarina Flaxman, and program associate, Nanase Shirakawa, who make all of this possible and who make all of the hard work that goes into Emerging Voices work so smoothly and appear so seemingly effortless. Along with my fellow jury members, Daniel Barber, Milton Curry, Mimi Wong, Rosanna Montiel, Ronald Real, Lola Shepard, and Rosalind Shea, our mission was to identify eight emerging practices in the US, Canada, or Mexico through an invited juried portfolio competition in order to recognize talented ind individuals and firms with a body of accomplished work that has the potential to influence the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, and urbanism if they haven't already done so. Uh, so we reviewed the, uh, the submissions being super attentive to important work that might resist easy translation into a, into a portfolio, a format which tends to privilege uh, seductive images. Both of the emerging voices tonight have inventive and complex approaches to the very agency of design. Both are global practices that have offices in multiple contents, continents, sorry, precisely so that they can have extremely local consequences. Both involve collective engagements with communities, local economies, and local material systems as instrumental in their design work. Their work is visually compelling, but to focus just on the visual would be to miss much of the substance. So the format of tonight's event, which is pre-recorded, well-crafted video-based presentations, followed by a group uh, discussion, we hope will work very well to expl explicate this substance. So allow me to introduce both sets of speakers. Low Design Office is bo uh, based in both Temagana uh, and also in Austin, Texas. It is a transatlantic collaboration between DK Oseo Asare and Ryan Bolum. And I'm pleased to say, from the standpoint of someone writing introductions, that their firm's name itself can comprise their introduction. So low design is essentially a critique of high design in architecture being defined by high culture, high expense, high levels of extraction, high on the hog. They ask instead, how might the negative associations with low, in a sense, be inverted? What if low means low expense, but high value, low carbon? low impact, low cost of entry, which makes architecture and design accessible as possible and not exclusive. In short, Low seeks to realize more with less. Low Design's work is also often low to the ground. The houses that they realize through design build strategies are built uh, as part of the landscape. And even the ones that are lifted on piles do so because they are in low lying flood zones. Their urban scale work in Ghana literally builds the earth and the architecture and coordinates the cultivation of the ground and bodies of water as instrumental to the built environment. Low Design Office uh, is also low DO or low do, and as a substantial part of their portfolios devoted to advancing the culture of making, this is clearly the case, whether it is directly through building things themselves or by leading their clients into becoming design builders, or through designing open source makerspace kiosks in Ghana that transform a scrapyard into Pan-African futures, that the act of making is integral to their practice. They have a fascinating body of work, and we are very pleased that both Brian and DK here. Uh, both are graduates of the GSD. DK is an assist, assistant professor at Penn State, and they have also taught at uh, UT San Antonio and the University of Florida, among other places. And they are currently teaching an advanced design studio at Princeton. The second speaker uh, is Conquie Design Initiative, KDI for short. Uh, 
uh, which was founded in 20, uh, 2006 to rethink how a group of designers might combat, combat issues of poverty, social alienation, and ecological degradation, in a sense by leveraging their collective and diverse skills to elevate design within communities by directly engaging and empowering those very communities. KDI is a BIPOC and woman-led firm with a network of over four dozen profession, uh, professionals, each with different expertise. And they have offices located in LA, Eastern Coachella, Nairobi, and Stockholm. Their work's distinction is that it seeks to center local leaders in the design and delivery of the public realm, seeking justice, equity, and resilience through an inclusive design process. They argue that the design project itself necessarily engages more complex, often uh, invisible economic policy, infrastructural and political systems. KDI, KDI works in all of these arenas and not surprisingly, their projects have a very long duration, often decades of sequential incremental work that has transformative substantial impacts on very specific neighborhoods. Their process as they succinctly put it is ask, listen, collaborate, and perhaps most importantly, and ingeniously, repeat. So we are very pleased that Chalina Odbert, the co-founder and executive director of KDI, and Joe Mulligan, the associate director of KDI, are both here with us tonight. Chalina received her master's of urban degree, uh, urban design degree from the GDS, uh, sorry, the GSD, that's the first time I've ever butchered that, uh, from the GSD, uh, and has worked all over the world, Africa, Latin America and the US, and she, uh, she also teaches at uh, UCLA. Joe is a civil engineer with degrees from both University of Cambridge and the Imperial College London, and also a PhD from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Needless to say, he too has worked all over the world, uh, India, China, Haiti, Malaysia, to just name a few. It's a pleasure to welcome you both, and it's a pleasure to welcome uh, all four of you. So let's move uh, directly into the two presentations with low design followed by KDI. And I should say that KDI graciously produced uh, their presentation in two parts, adding a section about their work uh, um, uh, that they've done over many years in uh, Kiberia at the request, specific request of the jury. Uh, and that second part will start after the credits uh, you'll see uh, at the end of their video. So let's launch launch into it. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing these and we'll re regroup as a group for the collective discussion after. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody out there. And thank you to the Architectural League of New York for the opportunity to be here. We are Low Design Office. Low, go. We run an architecture and integrated design studio based in Austin, Texas and Temagana. For us, low design means a number of things, but ultimately, it's about building equity in society. We try in small and incremental ways to improve human and planetary well being through design and making. We work to say no to imperialism and no to neo colonialism, to find out if low design can help us evolve out of non regenerative systems of extraction and exploitation. If we can lower the barrier to accessing design and architecture for environmental well being, then this is low design. By convention, architecture aspires to be the apex of high culture, but this is by definition exclusionary. At the same time that scarcity, real, artificial, imagined, is the primary source of human conflict and cause of human suffering, we all know that necessity is the mother of invention, and this remains as true today as ever. Resource-constrained environments can be valuable design challenges. Not only is there an ethical imperative to design for access, inclusion, and equity from the bottom up, lowness can present ample opportunity for design innovation. People often ask us why we set up a practice that works across two continents and how we collaborate. The answer is simple. Ryan is from Texas. And DK is gone American. So we have been a transatlantic practice from the get-go. In grad school, we discovered we shared interest in lowness, a desire to build change with our hands. We did a design build project with young people from the United Teen Equality Center in Lowell, Massachusetts, and maintained that partnership after graduating. We decided to work locally, but in tandem. This links up because we're both interested in using everyday accessible materials, tools, 
and equipment, working with communities of people involved in making buildings to structure environments that can grow. We think in similar ways in project development and certain design conversations and long-term participatory design research projects. We collaborate and exchange ideas and know-how. I lead the business U.S. design and construction, studying especially housing, and DK typically has led the work in West Africa with a focus on urban scale projects and research-driven microarchitecture fabrication. So far, we've been consistently small, never really more than five people in the office on both sides of the Atlantic, but we've collaborated with thousands. For us, low design is about making broad or high-level change concrete and tangible by working with people to build or realize their space. So we are particularly interested in how we can collaborate with clients and support a seamless design to delivery process flow. Mostly we do design build, but we follow a similar approach for projects from urban to building scale. But low design is also about identifying problems where they appear on the ground and enacting design as sustained action in the form of a site or issue specific intervention. This approach takes a site of design investigation into research and design procedures in order to generate the circumstances that can bring about feedback loops of positive change in communities. We started Lodo 15 years ago in the middle of grad school because the way we were being taught seemed obsolete or at least out of touch with the reality that we perceived that architecture as a discipline and as a profession is based on a false dichotomy. Architecture mirrors money and power. Look around you. Architecture maps society's power structure into space and the environment. Architecture aspires to the status of high culture. High class means sophisticated, high quality, high performance, design as luxury. All these things associate being modern with high cost and high impact on the environment. Fashion, wealth, and influence all come with a high price tag. But the idea of high society is fundamentally about exclusion. It defines lowness as something vulgar or unrefined that is somehow beneath architecture, good taste, and good design. Low corresponds to the lower classes, to the street and the ghetto, to popular in the sense of belonging to the masses, so therefore undesirable. Low cost means cheap and low quality means inferior, but sometimes maybe also low carbon footprint, because low means the absence of a lot. We view this as a solution. When we launched Lodo, the global financial crisis was unfolding into the Great Recession. Now, our home planet is even more in crisis, but we still believe in the same principle we did then, Architecture benefits if we engage resource-constrained contexts as sites of design innovation. Making architecture affordable can drive innovation where it matters most, where it can have the greatest impact, at the grassroots. All of our projects to date have really been micro-experiments to test out design strategies by building them. The first house that we designed and built in Texas had to keep costs below the alternative, buying and remodeling an existing house but we still wanted to create a contemporary design that responds to competing forces in East Austin, gentrification and the vernacular, the role of porches, verandas, and stoops. So we used off the shelf materials and finishes and repurposed construction debris left on the site into building materials, something that grew out of our work on low and no budget projects across the Atlantic and became a focus of all our work moving forward. Building a house shared by an extended family near the Guadalupe River challenged us to derive spatial opportunities from resilient design strategies because the site is in a floodway. The house and all equipment had to be located above the 100 year floodplain, which is roughly 13 foot above grade. Amongst other things, we took this as an opportunity to locate mechanical equipment and roof cutouts. These cutouts could also serve as outdoor play decks adjacent to the kids area, which could be monitored from the living area below. The Dakota Mountain Residence is a study investigating formal opportunities derived from the optimization of passive design strategies in terms of performance and economy, starting with a shed roof to collect rainwater, outdoor screens to protect from the sun and insects, followed by the removal of excess materials. This reduction in material provides an opportunity to amplify wind flows, 
bring natural light deep into interior spaces and create a thermal buffer from the hot Texas sun. The detached parasol roof collects 3,300 gallons for every inch of rainwater, which serves as the home's only source of water. The collection tank has already served through two events causing extreme water issues with Austin's water supply, something that is an increasing concern in the U.S. with climate change. Buildings give us more than just shelter. In Ghana and Nigeria, where we've been most active in West Africa, having water and power go off for a few hours or days is not uncommon. So it's normal to design off-grid systems or to build in redundancy. Considering buildings jointly with the materials, energy, equipment, and people that make them and keep them alive, we see this as a way to expand architecture into ecology. Throughout West Africa, there's a phenomenon we call kiosk culture, the network of tiny and small scale makers and entrepreneurs working out of microarchitecture, from peddlers who walk the city selling their goods and street hawkers who work traffic lights and intersections, to kiosks, sheds, shanties, and metal containers roofed with tarps and corrugated metal or installed temporarily under trees by roadsides in vacant lots and buildings still under construction, as well as adaptive workspaces housed in larger and more formal edifices. These spaces in between and at the bottom, where improvisation is automatic, support a broad belt of indigenous pan-African innovation, where grassroots innovators experiment relentlessly with old and new strategies and tactics for creating alternative futures. Kiosk culture is the DNA of the building industry in this context. Virtually no construction project in Africa today exists solely within the so-called formal sector, even as the vast majority of infrastructure for living currently being built in Africa does not directly involve architects. How can architecture be more inclusive? For us, the answer is to focus on participation. Buildings are a means to an end, not an end in themselves. Architecture is about building relationships, networks, and new opportunities. Design is an iterative process of prototyping with other people and across disciplinary boundaries to turn community participation into positive social action. Anam City is a community-initiated new town in eastern Nigeria designed for 30,000 people over 30 years. This project started with a site visit and a sketch. Then we used phones with GPS to map the site at one-to-one -one scale as part of a multi-year participatory design and planning process that we led to develop an open source model for sustainable development in Africa. We call this model Rurban because it combines urban densities of opportunity with paradigms of productive landscape based on traditional Igbo land use practices. Design can empower communities to make better components for human settlement with improved integration to ecological systems. But if infrastructure is like hardware, it needs the right operating system to function properly with software coded in the image of indigenous users. The ANAM model is to make building 50% about landscape, pairing housing with farming, life cycling materials, and building local construction capacity. Everything from building a dredger to collect sand from the Izichi River, to forming a construction company and building a factory for making compressed earth blocks with an open source design, the goal is to upskill people from the community to start their own businesses like converting quarries for sourcing raw material into earth ponds for fish farming, feeding aquaculture and agribusiness cooperatives. We've now advanced a version 2.0 of this model in collaboration with a private developer in Ghana, 
a 20 square mile new town for 100,000 plus people opposite the new international airport and the trans West African highway from Abuja to Abidjan. This design is a dynamic model instead of a static master plan, an alternative approach to the African smart city tuned for local culture, climate, and environment. Through a design build process, we can maximize design innovation even as the building process unfolds, ensuring that construction stays true to low impact ideals while exchanging knowledge with all the various experts and trades people involved in the construction ecosystem. We also experiment with what we refer to as extreme design build, where we co-design projects with clients and guide them in managing the building process such that they could run the construction process themselves. Now, some have even become general contractors and build for other people. The office ultimately centers the question, how to achieve more with less, suggesting both an endless loop of optimization with limited resources and inherently its own limitations. This is why we work to contribute to shared design commons, to build healthful spaces and empower communities through open design and co-creation. BAMBOTs are a series of prototypes under development for over a decade. Experimental bamboo microinfrastructures conceived as early stage species of a new type of living system with primitive metabolism, motility, and sentience operating in the space between architecture and furniture. We foresee a future wherein architecture is alive and mobile. Growing out of kiosk culture, BAMBOTs are part of an anticipatory research project toward that reformation of spatial experience architecture that can sense and interact with people and its environment, not in servitude to human society, but as part of an alternative model of collective ecological participation. These are low fidelity prototypes made over a few hours to a few days with a handful of makers and youth from the community with budgets of zero to hundreds of dollars. Currently, we're developing these prototypes in collaboration with the Anna Institute for Art and Knowledge piloting a new vision for Ghana's museums, monuments, natural heritage, and all artifacts of Ghanaian provenance in museums worldwide. Our goal is to make the future accessible to everyone, including in Africa, the youngest and fastest growing continent. Maker spaces are workshops that provide access to tools, equipment, and expertise around digital design, fabrication, synthetic biology, and making in general. We launched AMP, the Agroblochi Makerspace platform with Pan Urban, the Paris-based strategic design consultancy, as a pan-African participatory design initiative to build alternative futures cooperatively. AMP networks the practical know-how of grassroots makers with the technical knowledge of students and young professionals in STEAM fields. Working in and around the Agulochi scrapyard in Accra, over 2,000 youth from West Africa, Europe, and the United States have collaborated to design and prototype what we call Spacecraft, an open architecture for making, which consists of a deployable makerspace kiosk and a set of customizable tools and equipment, plus a digital platform for makers and recyclers. Modular, mobile, low cost, and open source Spacecraft operate as a set of tools and equipment to craft spaces that remix physical and digital, enabling makers with limited means to jointly navigate and terraform their environment. So far with this project, which is also an open source design, we've deployed five modules of AMP spacecraft made in Ghana and Senegal and traveling by land and sea to Mauritania and Germany. All of our residential projects have explored ideas of incremental and adaptive housing, which we've really started to push over the last couple of years. Similar to models of open building, the arrangement of a series of modular housing blocks offers inhabitants micro capacity to resize and reconfigure their dwelling units according to a sequence of possible scenarios. This general capability of all the people living together in a neighborhood to jointly reconstruct it over time through largely autonomous small scale market driven procedures enables democratic community formation 
and mobility otherwise absent in expensive, rapid growing markets. There are many approaches to design praxis, and we understand that ours is by no means perfect. In fact, the nature of our practice, the ways in which we experiment through collaboration forces us to face shortcomings head on, but this also enables us to understand limitations and push boundaries. Our practice research that social impact and environmental sustainability constitute architecture's core. Maybe low, Maybe low is, is the, the new minimalism. minimalism. The world, the is, world in crisis is in crisis and design can, and help. Design can help. Coachella isn't just a music festival. It's actually an entire valley and a diagram of inequity. In the West Valley, towns like Palm Springs call to mind luxury. Golf courses, pools, day spas, and weekend homes are supported by great infrastructure and networks of well-developed, well-appointed public spaces and transportation options. To the east, the valley tells a very different story. There's toxic dust that's turned up by the evaporating Salton Sea, which is heightening health risks for residents and climate-related risks for the entire region. Poverty rates are high. Infrastructure is very underdeveloped or in disrepair. And the governance system of these unincorporated towns just isn't set up to tackle these issues. When we founded KDI in 2006, we were determined to work in geographies like this, places of extreme inequity that design and planning had too often just overlooked. Today, there are over 50 of us across four offices in Los Angeles, the Coachella Valley, Nairobi, and Stockholm. And a kaleidoscope of disciplines, landscape architecture, urban planning, architecture, civil engineering, and community development. At the core of what we do, we use design as a tool for social justice, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. In the Eastern Coachella Valley, 12 projects over 10 years work together to build a just, complete, and inclusive public realm across disciplines, scales, budgets, and jurisdictions. Collectively, they respond to the community voiced needs of public space, environmental justice, transportation access, affordable housing, and really a basic right to a decent quality of life like the one present in the West Valley. But most of these challenges like climate risk and poverty don't exist at the scale of a single site. They're regional issues and they need a layered, coordinated, regional design response. So our intervention in the Valley isn't, and actually really can't be just a single project. Instead, it's a network of public spaces, a series of environmental actions, and multiple housing and transportation projects all working together. For the longest time, there were no publicly accessible open spaces in the Eastern Coachella Valley. You'd have to drive 30 minutes to get to a park. Nuestro Lugar in the unincorporated area of North Shore is the first community-driven, fully public space in the Eastern Coachella Valley. The pavilion is a beacon of the community's identity, but it is also kind of sets the stage for the community defining their future story. A sports hub, uninterrupted play. Topography reframes the landscape and shifts our perception of it. Totems tell stories and they give directions. 
The infrastructure protects the environment and also invites people to use it in a socially supportive way. Now in construction, very soon, a larger park will provide the second piece of that network, providing more infrastructure physically, but also socially, economically, politically. Fields, new markets, a community center, a nature playground, a therapeutic garden, all of these amenities for this vulnerable yet resilient valley. A third park in the neighboring community of Thermal is next. Just finishing up development, today it's a field of date palms, harvested by the very residents that have designed its future. The key to what KDI does is to talk to people. We ask questions, and importantly, we listen to the answers and we see if those answers give us a clue as to how our skills as designers may be useful to the efforts that community members are often already leading on their own. But parks alone, design alone, is not enough. In the West Valley, you've got this really extensive transportation infrastructure, bus, bike, pedestrian, all linking leisure spaces and logistics. And that all stops when you get to the Eastern Coachella Valley. And with that, you lose access to jobs, to hospitals, to schools, to basic services, to opportunity. In our earliest meetings, Eastern Coachella Valley residents told us that they needed better ways to get around the area. And it was great and vital to have new parks, but without better mobility infrastructure, it'd be hard to get to the parks. The only way to add this mobility infrastructure was to unlock state funds. And to do that, we had to create a county-adopted mobility plan, which meant we needed the county transportation department on board. So we negotiated with them, they agreed, and we were able to start working with residents to create the mobility plan. Transportation plans are highly technical things. This process gave residents the tools to make choices about where they wanted to put new transportation infrastructure, how they wanted it to function, so that everyone could get around by bike, on foot, on skates, safely and easily. This new infrastructure is going to connect the parks, it's going to connect people to their friends and family all around the Eastern Coachella Valley and it's going to help create a healthier environment, and it's going to connect to opportunity. So at KDI, our design approach is not only focused on designing the material forms that comprise the built environment, but also the design of the financial and political processes that lead to those forms. In Kenya, in California, in dense urban environments and in rural communities, we work with policymakers and government officials to make projects possible, and we find funders to make them feasible. The challenges of the Eastern Coachella Valley are really just a pattern language for a systemic challenge that we face as designers in the places that need our services the most the places where social, environmental, economic, and political risks collide. These places might not have the administrative infrastructure or the budgets, or even the political will to take on these design challenges, but in no place is the work more urgent. In communities like these, the standard way of working, identifying the problem, allocating the budget, and calling for design services just doesn't work. The work is not fast. It isn't linear. And it's certainly not guaranteed. All of us believe in the possibilities of design. And with that belief comes a great responsibility. Design can make places more inclusive and equal, but it can also make them 
exclusive and fraught with risk. Looking at our communities today, it's clear we must do this job better. Not on occasion, not when extra time prevails, but with every project and every practice, every line we lay on the page. It's not an aspiration. It is the essential charge of our professions. The Kibera Public Space Project is the precedent for our Eastern Coachella Valley Initiative and is the founding project of KDI. It reconceives of the role of the designer as sole author and seeks to reconstruct the client-designer relationship to invite multiple actors to share decision-making power through a design process. The project is in Nairobi, Kenya, in an informal settlement called Kibera. Kibera is just minutes from the city center, but until recently, it was a place that was literally off the map. It's the size of Central Park and home to over 200,000 people. In its 100 year history, the end of colonial rule and urbanization have driven its exponential growth in the recent decades. Kibera is a dense and vibrant place, also known as God's great city. Like the Eastern Coachella Valley, it too is a diagram of inequity. It lacks sanitation infrastructure, the water supplies are precarious, road networks are inadequate, and land tenure is fraught. In spite of this, and because of this, community networks are strong, and innovation and entrepreneurship are abundant. The Kibera Public Space Project is a network of 11 and counting productive public spaces that overcome the constraints of available space by reclaiming waste spaces along the tributaries of the Gong River to create a spine of access and infrastructure. Because of the contested land tenure in Kibera, each site is designed to be semi-permanent using simple materials and basic construction techniques. The site layer physical amenities with social and economic interventions to address the intersectional needs of the community and ensure the sustainability of each space. Our first site was a flooded crime hotspot and dumping site at the mouth of the river. Reimagined to house an outdoor amphitheater, a community hall, a playground and small garden. Ten years later, the community partner that helped design and build the site has sustained and added multiple amenities, including a sanitation center and a greenhouse. Other sites in the network add amenities while also introducing our partners to new income generating skills, like our second site, which is built of soil bricks and is home to a water and sanitation center vending kiosks and a playground. Still others like our fifth site take these baseline elements and add critical infrastructure linking the formal and informal cities such as this pedestrian bridge designed and built with residents and municipal government. And because each site is selected through an RFP process open to all residents and groups in Kibera, some sites, like our eighth site, have a singular pre-existing focus, like this school. Here, we created a formal structure for an informal yet thriving elementary school and added amenities for the larger community. Here too, trainees from our Carpentry Academy did the wood and bamboo fit out of the project. Our 10th site is actually a piece of multi-benefit flood redu reduction infrastructure rooted in a low-tech, highly robust river remediation system 
It also provides a community laundry facility, a playground, and a shaded leisure space. And our most recent 11th site is an example of the creative responses often born out of the myriad of design constraints of each space. Here in this 2000 square foot site, the severe flooding in the area required a strategy to reduce flooding without giving up community space. This led the team to build an underplaza stormwater facility, repurposing old coke crates for storage and infiltration. This site is today home to a youth center, a refurbished sanitation block, a play structure, and an outdoor pavilion. But perhaps the most critical component of this network, which has been built by Kenyan designers and residents, is the human one. Today, over 500 community members power the groups that operate each site, and collectively, these groups formerly called the Kibera Public Space Network, have become a powerful political and social force in the settlement and beyond. They spark change as a network that otherwise wouldn't be possible. The core principles of this Kibera Public Space project, participation, integration, and networking have become the foundational elements of our practice at KDI and can be seen in all of our projects around the globe whether it's a built work, a planning process, a policy change or a research initiative, we understand these elements to be key to building a more just, equitable and inclusive public realm. Thank you all. Um, we, we now get the pleasure of turning on our, our uh, our cameras and Sieg, <laughs> you know, all existing within the same space. So it's a really um, uh, fantastic presentations. I mean, one of the advantages of the video is it does allow you to have this kind of compact, but it's almost too compact, right? There's so much information. Um, I've uh, full disclosure uh, moments before we uh, we moved into the talk. I found out that actually uh, low and uh, and uh, uh, Kunkui actually have worked together. Is that, um, it, how did that happen? Can you kind of talk a little bit about, about your collaborative practices with each other? I guess I'll jump in on that one. Um, so I mean, we, we know of each other's work from, we went to school together um, uh, and we had similar interests and we, uh, we saw an opportunity and a competition um, and we reached out to them as community partners, landscape designers, thinkers, policy thinkers, um, and and luckily, uh, Shalina said yes. And so and so we started working together for the first time, really, in six or seven years. Although we knew each other pretty intimately at, at school. And I think one thing that is always striking to me is um, there's Lodo, there's KDI, but really there were there was a movement at the GSD at the mm. time that we were all there and we were all part of a, a group called SOCA that was a group dedicated to moving design to a more justice driven um, space within the curriculum and also within kind of uh, the, the practices that were represented um, in the faculty at the GSD. And so it, when I look back at it now, there's five or six firms, all who have kind of a, a similar commitment to a, a different mode of practice that came out of that time. And, and so it's really nice to be um, in conversation with one of those groups of friends tonight. Can you can you expand on that? Because I one of the things that I'm very curious about in general um, that becomes that, that's kind of kind of crucial to tonight's uh, kind of presentations is the shifting agency of design, shifting agency of what designers, architects, urban, uh, urban uh, designers, landscape architects need to do, should do, and also how they are being taught and what needs to change. Can you um, each speak to what you would regard as being your biggest critique of conventional practice um, and what, fun, what you think most significantly needs to change uh, within the discipline? And maybe we start with Lodo first. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll add one comment on this because of uh, what Ryan and Shalini just mentioned about maybe the origin story. And, and when you introduced Paul, I think you even used 
like a phrase or a term where you talked about something along the lines of the agency of design. And I think that's uh, an important one because we actually organized uh, a conference, actually a couple conferences sort of around, around a weekend, but um, one of them was specifically framed as systems, systems of inclusion. And it was around mm -hmm. the theme of design agency. And I think the question that we asked then, and, and when Shalini speaks of this sort of micro movement or a number of sort of firms and, and sort of initiatives that not necessarily, well, that were all kind of in proximity at that time, I think one of the things that we were trying to understand was we know the world is complex. We know there are these really macro system scale uh, issues within society that are sort of global and big and, you know, and how do you tackle them? Like, how do you actually engage them? And, and those define the structures within which design typically operates. And so are you kind of condemned to always be working within the system or how can you actually shift it towards greater equity and justice? And I think that's, again, I think a thought that is important, I think from my perspective, because it's still an ongoing question, like what actually is the agency of design? Are we just making things look prettier? And I mean, but how do you actually change the system? And I think in terms of the other aspect of it is like, what is the critique of contemporary sort of approaches? There's, this is gonna be, I think, probably one of the big things we talk about and there's lots of different angles, but the one thing I'll throw in the ring is that, um, we're not collaborative enough. We're just not. I mean, everyone is like the way school is taught, everyone focuses on their own project. And to work kind of collect collectively and cooperatively um, is just still so outside people's comprehension. And the question is always, well, how do you survive? How do you make money? But if we don't address these issues, then we are self-selecting to not only be working within the system, but I would also offer, we're essentially making ourselves obsolete in the future. I think to the question of kind of what's the critique of the traditional practice, I, I like to try to stay away from saying that, you know, you, it, there's one way to practice versus another and one is right and one is wrong. But one thing I think I can say kind of universally is that I feel like too many practices don't recognize their power. I, I hear a lot that, you know, design is a service industry. And so we, we create projects when we're invited to create them or when we are commissioned to create them. But if you just kind of expand your practice a little bit beyond the, the, the actual designing of the built intervention and begin to look at where design intersects with policy or where the built environment um, intersects with issues of justice, then there are so many openings for us as designers to, to take more of an activist approach to our practice. And that doesn't mean every firm becoming like a KDI or a Lodo, but it does mean looking for the moments within any project, no matter how kind of commercial, traditional, you know, high design it may be, to look for those opportunities to make sure that your project is actually contributing to an inclusive, equitable, public realm built environment as opposed to uh, creating yet one other barrier to achieving that type of equity in the built environment. Yeah, thanks, Shalina. And um, to, to, to connect to what you're saying there, I think, um, you know, in my, in my own um, personal journey and coming from an engineering background um, and having practiced in a more kind of traditional um, engineering design uh, setting, I think you know that I've, there's always been that interest in in connecting um, engineering design principles to questions of uh, ecological um, impact and also also social impact as well. Um, and then it it kind of becomes a, a an issue or a question of how you actually do that within within the educational system of design um, or, or within practice as well. And I think um, one of the, the kind of um, uh, revelations of working in a, in a practice like KDI has been not only bringing together different design disciplines, but also placing them alongside and at the same uh, level in a sense as 
um, peace and justice work, as, as social work, as um, community organizing, community mobilization. Um, and as Shalina says, you can't you can't do that or achieve that in every in every practice. But I think there are ways that we can think about doing that in um, in in design education um, and and looking for opportunities to kind of uh, remove ourselves from the kind of sanctity of our of our single disciplines and opening up on that on that broader level. And then I think we've we've talked a considerable amount of you know, how much control do you need as a designer? And once you start to realize you can maybe relinquish some of that control in these more collaborative, integrative collaborative environments, you might be able to learn something from someone else that you didn't really know. They may be able to lead things in a better way than you. And hopefully you're also, you know, providing them with new ways to see things as well. Well, that, um, I mean, I one of the, one of the discussions that that uh, I've been part of and um, and it is, uh, is is quite uh, you know, it comes up both in in professional and academic context is um, as you know we engage the you know converging crises of climate, racial, social equity, justice. Um, where what is the expertise of the architect the designer what is it that you bring in these collaborations what is it that you all think you're bringing oh there's so much and that I, that's not to oversell what designers can do because i think sometimes we think we can kind of do it all but the built environment i've, I've been saying this a lot lately but the built environment isn't neutral and you need look no further than this very um, illustrative research that says the greatest predictor of life expectancy is the neighborhood you live in. And that isn't related to genetics by neighborhood or anything like that. The biggest drivers of that life expectancy as it relates to neighborhood is driven by things like access to social infrastructure, um, safety in your neighborhood, um, removal from environmental hazards. And all of those things are things that urban designers, architects, civil engineers, planners, like those are the projects that come to our table. We design the transportation networks. We design community structure, uh, community centers. We uh, bring all of these different layers at the site scale and at the city scale into play uh, to build a community. And, and that's, of course, just one piece of it, but you know, the data is there. It, if, if we as designers do our job better, if we take our, the approaches we take to infrastructure or to any project, big or small, has more of a kind of fundamental equity lens at its heart, then people will live longer. So I think we have a pretty big role to play. And I think in, in terms of just the architect or architect's role in, in designing in a gentrifying community, there, you know, we can't stop gentrification and there, there has to be public policy, there has to be other things to work with us. Um, but we can approach design in a community that respects the community and engages the community in a way that might incentivize people who can stay to stay rather than to make them feel like outsiders are coming in and taking over. So one, one, um, one other thing I found fascinating about both of your work is that you often try to find a way to engage people directly in the buildings themselves, right? Whether through design build or literally fabricating um, uh, components and to not, so in a sense, use the architecture as a training device, as a kind of means of income. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you bring that into your own processes? Like how do you design the possibility for others being involved in the making? How does that change how you think about uh, what you're doing as designers? Uh, how you even think about drawings uh, and setting forth the, the nature of the project?
It's like the problem about Not four people. It's like too many people. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough when there's two. There's four of you. Like you know, it's like uh, who, who, who? Uh, uh, maybe DK or Joe. I mean, I can I can try and jump in. My internet is a little bit glitchy, so if if you lose me, send me a chat or something. But I think building off of what was just said, I think another aspect where the let's say design expert person in quotes is kind of a bridge has to do with, with between sort of the design and the making and, and then sort of the making becomes a tool towards something else. But is that um, the words that come into my mind is kind of like a technical imagination. And what I mean by that is that one of uh, my good friends who's worked with us for over 10 years in Ghana, Kay, used to always sort of joke that, you know, people believe what they I can see and that the ability to see a place and recognize how it could be transformed and to be able to translate from sort of a possibility space in your mind into some type of process that can systematically bring you towards manifesting that or realizing it in the space, that's not something that comes natural to everyone or which everyone has a sort of equal degree of proficiency in. And I think that that's part of the role of a designer is to help people transition from kind of problem or possibility space into an actuality. And the way that relates to, I think, making is that, and this speaks also to this, I mean, you, you mentioned this, Paul, but this sort of, um, this foregrounding of the visual within the design disciplines, people are so focused on what something looks like that that stands as a proxy for the thing itself, but buildings or a site or, you know, some kind of built environment context is not just the physical things that are there, but it's also the ways in which that environment is enabled to act on and with the people that enter into those spaces. And if you just build something and then people come there, it can have an impact, but the entire process of making it with people um, can change their views. It can change their capabilities. Um, it can remind them of ways in which they can be empowered. It can bring people together. And so if you divorce that aspect of making things from community engagement, then invariably you've kind of reduced uh, the possibilities or the impact of this into sort of something that's just a kind of shell or a sort of small piece of it, of what it can be. Yeah, and, and I, uh, to, to connect to that, I think um, there's, uh, as DK was saying, there's this kind of um, the transition um, from, from, from this kind of possibility into the realization of something um, in, in space. And, you know, oftentimes in the, in the neighborhoods that we're working in, in the communities we're working in, the, the uh, culture of making uh, is, is very strong. So there's, there's, there's something um, to, to build on there. For example, in Kenya, the, the, the Juakali um, uh, culture, which is uh, a making culture um, across the country, is is producing all types of um, very practical, very creative, um, uh, different types of fabrication for all types of different uses. And so it's there's um, the possibility of kind of building on that and and um, and realizing it in new um, conceptions. And I think that's where the power of of um, of drawing and, and and rendering, which you alluded to, Paul, kind of comes in. I think that's where designers ha um, ha can have a really big impact. And I've seen, um, you know, great examples where where renderings, really good, high quality, um, 3D visualizations, are being put in um, in place in in communities which wouldn't normally have exposure to that type of realization and it really brings um, home to people the possibility of spaces but also how um, different um, fabrications can kind of um, live in a new um, uh, a new 3d um, possibility so I think drawing is is huge and um, even in a very practical sense my um, my my colleague in Kenya has just been producing as built drawings of of several of our um, uh, of our uh, public spaces, utilities, where the drainage is, you know, what how big this this infrastructure is. That doesn't exist for many many structures in 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 these neighborhoods. But it's very practical when it comes to future changes and the dynamic nature of of settlements as well. 
so the kind of um, the basics of drawing and architecture are, are, I think, important and powerful in, in, in that context. When you're when you're working on these iterative projects, and both of you, I mean, um, both of you are involved in projects that are that are long term. They're iterative. They evolve. They change. What you anticipated, you know, ten years ago is probably not where they are now because you couldn't predict exactly where they were going to go. Um, what are the unanticipated um, kind of ways in which projects have evolved. And I'd be curious, particularly relative to the Kibera project uh, uh, or even the, the work in uh, the Eastern Coachella Valley, what, what are the um, projects that have unfolded from the process that surprised you that were kind of unanticipated uh, as you started the process? I think the first thing that we get comfortable with at the beginning of each project is the, un the unanticipated points that we are going to encounter along the way. And so I think our starting point is to know that whatever we've thought the process is, it, we can't really rely on it for too, for too much of the way. And this is because we're doing projects in places where they haven't been done before and they have, there is no RFP for them. There is nobody who's already committed to working in this way to solve these problems. So we're often trying to push people in new directions to do things they haven't done before, they may not want to do. And that is just really, all, all that is is anticipating what the next move might be and, and what your counter move can be when it comes. So. I don't know, there are too many stories to tell, but, but I think something that happens often in the Eastern Coachella Valley, in Los Angeles, in Nairobi, is the way that the political tides shift. So you may start a project without a lot of kind of official political support. Uh, maybe we've seeded a project with philanthropic dollars or through some other um, mechanism and that allows us to get something on the ground, kind of a proof of concept that we hope we can use to then leverage larger interventions and ultimately connect those to an intervention at scale. But that only works if by doing those kind of micro moves, we can um, use them as kind of advocacy tools to bring government agencies on board, like to bring them into the fold. And I think it happens, something that always surprises me is, is it works more often than I would have expected it to. Like sometimes there's a project in Los Angeles that we work on, that, that we started, which was about with a group of other nonprofits, not all design, in fact, none of the other firms are design firms, to reclaim vacant city-owned lots because half of the city predominantly low-income communities of color don't have access to a park, but they have many city-owned vacant lots. Mm -hmm. And in the process of figuring out how we were going to get access to these lots, we decided, okay, why don't we just start by like transforming a couple of them for a weekend and seeing if we can get political folks to come out and witness it. And maybe just maybe like the sheer act of them seeing with their own eyes and touching and feeling like what this could be will do something. And long story, it was kind of like, I remember us talking in the office, like this could be such a waste of time. We could just be doing these like weekend events that take so much time and effort and money and all for nothing. And long story short, you know, it took some time. It took four years, but four years later, we have a city sanctioned, adopt a lot program where resident groups can adopt city owned vacant lots for up to two years at a time and then ultimately buy them from this city for a dollar or something like that. So that that the way that you kind of the unanticipated ways in which projects can go from the very micro scale to something that really can have a regional or citywide effect. Um, and the reverse can happen, you know, you can kind of your large scale plans can be shut shut down and really move back to the micro level by the forces of political will is um, something that we encounter basically daily. 
So there's a there's a question in the chat that that connects to this, which is, what about the relationship with local authorities? Can you share some tips on how to make it productive? And that's a big one. Um, <laughs> and I'd even argue or add to that. What is the? Could you talk a little bit about the freedom and constraints that might be different between working in, say, Ghana or Nairobi versus uh, LA or Austin, Texas? Should I kick that one off? I mean, I think, um, well, first, in terms of how you kind of reframe the question in a way, Paul, I think it's important because there's local authorities, there's local authorities, and there's local authorities. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously differences at the same time that there are lots of similarities between local authorities in Texas and local authorities in Ghana. But if I start by maybe speaking to the Ghana context, um, I would say maybe there's two two things and one one sort of comes back to the earlier comment the earlier discussion which has happened but i think the first one is that there are a lot of different let's say authorities at the local level and so to explain what i mean by that in most of well, not most if i say for the the countries that were formerly part of british west africa so at least like for example ghana and nigeria there are two simultaneous legal frameworks active within the country which is kind of schizophrenic because you have statutory law, which is like the legal frameworks that exist in the United States and which interface with global legal structures and economic systems. But you also have customary law, which is based on traditional rulership um, and sort of traditional structures within society. They're both valid. And so for certain kinds of issues, I mean, it's kind of like civil and criminal law, but in a slightly different way. So you can take certain issues and disputes to sort of both of those trajectories. And so you immediately have sort of multiple authorities that are active within a space. Um, but then when you compound that by multiple tribes or ethnic groups, um, and then local government, and then uh, federal government, which is present locally, you very often have lots of competing uh, authorities at the local level. So um, I guess that's a first thing because it's not really always so black and white, like that's the authorities, this another person, everything is a negotiation. Um, I think the second aspect to that, which I is what I alluded to, ties back to the earlier conversation is, um, you know, we, when we started our practice, we, one of the things I think we did take out of uh, our educational sort of environment was the idea of projects as seeds. And I feel like Shalina was also speaking to that. And I think that um, you can choose to talk a lot about something or you can choose to do something. And if you focus on just talking a lot with local authorities, you might get really frustrated oftentimes. But I think if you can hybridize your approach both between talking to lots of people and keeping them abreast of what you're trying to do, involving them, asking for permission sometimes before, after, during, but also doing, what we found many times is that once things start to happen, people totally support it. And I think, again, that's been mentioned. And I think that relates to both contexts that the more you can demonstrate evidence of the value of something, then you don't have to talk about it very much because it's right in front of people. And then they're like, can we just celebrate this or put it on our website or can we help somehow? And that's a much better conversation than trying to convince or be significant. Yeah, just to to add to that discourse, I think um, it's a it's a fascinating um, and important question that um, that's that's been been asked here by uh, by Wally. And I'll say something about um, Nairobi, which I think connects to what DK was saying. And um, Nairobi is is uh, uh, was a colonial city as well, and and the um, the historical um, planning and, and realization of that city was essentially anti anti African, anti Black African um, in the colonial period, and then a kind of post Second World War, a, an apartheid style system. And in the post colonial period, that's um, been manifested by uh, what. Edgar Pitase and, and Supranel from the African Center for Cities in South Africa call almost like an anti-urban um, um, polity in the in, in, in city municipalities. So the 
um, one of the upshots of that is that there's a relatively limited um, urban planning design capacity with it at the municipal level to consider the question of, of the city. And so how I think that connects to our, our, um, our work in, in, in Nairobi over the years has been a bit like DK was saying, a combination of, of, of talking and sharing and, and making sure that all actions are linked to municipal level efforts, but also in, in doing and putting facts on the ground and, and, and showing what's possible through the power of good design um, and good participation. And I think if you can keep those two things in balance and you start to engage those municipal actors and, and also show how design and planning can, can, can be done differently. And I think that's, that's been how we've, we've tried to work over the years in Nairobi. So there's a question that's gotten at least three thumbs up, meaning I better ask it uh, or I'm going to be in trouble, which is uh, how do you make money? Uh, and a variant on that, how do you support your work financially? Uh, and the related question of, uh, are you happy with the structure of an independent firm as the best way or only way to carry out the kind of work that you do? Are there other complementary ways to do this work? Uh, radically reimagined core uh, core of architects working for local government, for example. Uh, so Ryan, how do you make how do you make money, and what uh, uh, what about your relationship to being an independent firm? And is there some argument for a, a better collective that we should we should all try to advocate for? Well, how do you make money is a, a real good question. Um, we're still trying to figure that out, but I think I think we're getting there. It's I think when we started, you know, we could have we could have tried to become a nonprofit, which a lot of the work we're doing in the nonprofit realm, but that's not what we were interested in. Because I think ultimately for us, if what we're trying to do is show a proof of concept that you can be a market-driven practice and be sustainable and create projects and make projects and be, you know, make money. And I think it takes time and perseverance. Um, but I, I think, you know, especially with the work we've, we're doing here, um, we're in a capitalist world. And so we have to figure out how to make our projects and designs and thinking um, accessible to developers. And so how do you have, like, can we look at the systems and work within the systems to make more accessible strategies, something that you can develop? And if you can actually sell something to a developer, then you've done your job. And so I think we, we, we look at it from that standpoint. Um, I think uh, DK could probably, you know, he has some very strong opinions on this. He can talk more to it, but about, you know, making, thinking about design in terms, like being more of a business person. Architects haven't historically been business people and they somehow want to shy away from it. Um, but thinking about design more as product-based, how can you create something that, that can then be replicable? And, and that's this idea of the open source. How can you start to generate designs that can be shared to create broader, you know, broader reach, but you can somehow also make money off those things. Um, and ultimately, I mean, we are in some ways, we approach things as sometimes as developers. And ultimately we've talked a lot about, you know, do we want like, do we want to be a develop, design, build type of practice? And that, that takes on a lot. And I'm, I'm not sure we want to do that, but we've, we've thrown around the idea of, you know, maybe to have the largest impact in terms of people, we should become, you know, track home builders and try and rethink track homes. Um, and, you know, so we, we're willing to try a lot of things. Um, to, I think that the second question of how does it work being an independent designer? Um, that's also a question we've, we've considered a bunch. Um, I mean, for us, it, you know, what I ask is like, how, how big do you want to become and how much control do you need? And ultimately, when you, you know, you have these, how, how large, how large of a firm do you, do you need and how many people do you need to control? And I think, I don't know, for us, we've realized we like to stay small and nimble and collaborate more because we can move in and out and be really, uh, really, you know, throw ourselves at a project and, and understand the client and the people in the process and collaborate deeply um, rather than to have a lot of people working for us to try and execute our ideas. And obviously there's a balance there. 
Um, I'm not sure what the number is, but I think we're, we're definitely on the side of staying small. Uh, Selena, I know that, you know, you're uh, often firms will kind of list how large they are to kind of show the kind of brute force of their strengths. But your listing of 50 people is, is almost more to show your nimbleness and your ability to operate in multiple arenas. Can you talk about, you know, this question of how do you make money? How do you how do you work with 50 people? What is, you know, how, to, how does this unfold? I mean, at some level, you already are that core of architects, right? <laughs> uh, designers, thinkers, et cetera, engaging the problems of our time, right? Well, I, I think a couple of things that come to mind immediately. One is that we never intended to be a team of 50 people or whatever number we, um, you know, ultimately get to. Uh, it's really grown out of necessity. And, and I think critically, and no offense to the architects in the room here, but I think critically, we aren't 50 architects. We mm -hmm. are a multidisciplinary team that certainly includes architects, but landscape architects, community organizers, you know, you heard it in the video. Um, and it's that kind of, that collective that allows us to make money the way we do, which is what I'll get to next. So we, we are a nonprofit firm and, you know, that sort of, that just kind of more of how we started than a, a really intentional decision. After we were working for a couple of years, we did look intentionally to say, should we remain a nonprofit or should we become some sort of hybrid practice or be a for-profit practice? And ultimately we stayed as a nonprofit. Um, but when you really look at our projects and, and our funding streams, what you see is that we kind of look half like a traditional firm and half like a nonprofit firm. Our funding comes about 40% or 40 from traditional philanthropy. And we use that to seed projects, which I can say a, a bit more about in a second. And then the other half comes from traditional RFPs, the, the same way that all the rest of us get work. Maybe the only difference there is that the RFPs that we team on or that we go after are mission aligned. So you wouldn't be able to look at our portfolio of work and necessarily identify which ones are the philanthropic projects or which ones are the um, you know, RFP funded projects. And on the philanthropic side, and the reason we ultimately decided to stay as a nonprofit is it really gives us that agency going back to the, that early, those early conversations about what we were seeking as designers. It gives us this agency to identify problems and begin to work on a solution without waiting for the RFP to come out, without waiting for the official decision-making powers to, to deem it a priority. We can work with residents, we can work with people that are living these experiences every day and hear from them that it's a priority and then begin to kind of work in reverse to connect it back to the official power brokers uh, to, to make it a priority for them too. And so with our seed funding, we often kind of try to make it hard for a, a government agency or kind of scale partner to say no. So sometimes we use that seed funding to do a first round of design services or to invest in kind of a feasibility study that may prove the case. For example, the, the life expectancy work. Once you show someone that in Malibu, people live 15 years longer than Watts, which is just a few miles away, you get someone's attention. And then you can start to pitch projects that they have the resources and capacity and, and jurisdiction to invest in. We do that a lot. There's a, that dovetails into another question, which is, are you, know, as administrations change, um, uh, particularly in the states, uh, are you um, are you optimistic about the next four years or even the next year um, uh, relative to uh, funding, to questions of nonprofits, to even uh, the focus on the crises that are uh, that we're all uh, uh, needing to attend to? Well, I'll just say I was optimistic in the Trump administration. So um, I, <laughs> I, I tend to uh, take an optimistic view 
no matter what. So maybe someone else could give a better answer. Well, I don't want to be the negative person because <laughs> I think I come across as the doom and gloom. I mean, I, I'm not so super, I mean, I'm also generally speaking an optimist. Otherwise, we wouldn't engage in this kind of work and it would be hard to sort of get up in the morning. So um, I think there are some reasons to be optimistic, but I also think there are a lot of reasons not to be like, and I think speaking to the current pandemic, I can't think of a better example to sort of have x-ray vision of how messed up the world is in terms of how the vaccine is being distributed globally and the ways in which sort of wealthier countries are holding on to sort of certain ideas around protecting intellectual property rights when it's a sort of very cut and dry kind of ethical frame around um, whose lives are more valuable within the world. So if I had seen a kind of more sort of fundamental seismic shift in terms of our, our paradigms of global togetherness, I would feel slightly more optimistic. I think the thing which compounds with that, and I, I sort of maybe foreshadowed this earlier when I said that in many ways, I feel like uh, some of the sort of professions are making themselves obsolete is that if you pay attention to sort of futures much at all, it's pretty clear how the future is gonna play out, which is that capital wins because automation comes into play and can displace a lot of the things that human beings are doing. And a lot of people say, oh, well, jobs will be reinvented, they'll be remade, there'll be new jobs. Sure, that's true, but it doesn't change the fact that sort of computational machines and sort of their extension into physical environment is gonna radically disrupt sort of design for the built environment and the professions and the sort of ways in which sort of people make money today. So I think the last thing I would say to it is, I always, I always say like, if you, want a, if you want a car, you don't go to a car designer and say, please design me a car. And then you take those blueprints to a car maker and then they build you a car and then you drive it home. That's not how it works. And, and the cost of cars and the ways in which cars and vehicles are distributed around the world is part of an entirely different framework of design and delivery. And I think that, that to some extent, we're not fully engaging the ways in which we have to radically embrace technology and, and reformulate how we design and make things in the world. Um, and if we don't do that and shift everything that can be done by machines into a regime where machines do it and find new ways for humans to collaborate, then I think it's gonna make, it, there's a very real risk that it can actually drive disparity um, within the built environment. Could you could you position? I mean, I, I find that I, I find that argument super interesting, and I'm curious how you would position the work you're doing with the informal kiosks, um, the kind of uh, using the scrapyard as the basis for invention. How does that fit into those? Because that's not the kind of typical perception of technology being deployed with raw materials to produce the newest and the best. Right? It's a very different model of even kind of. What, what you were on, uh, you know, putting out there as being the model for cars. It's a, it's a different, and I'm curious that have you positioned that work in the very critique that you just unfolded? So I'll try and I'll do this as brief as I can because I don't want to derail everything. <laughs> and you know, this could be a whole thing unto itself, but I think in a nutshell, that project is, is very much central, central to trying to, as Ryan said earlier in the video, sort of conduct a series of micro experiments about alternative possibilities. And um, a simple way of looking at it is that Africa is today growing demographically at the fastest rate in human history. So we know that over the next decades, there'll be one to two billion more people living in cities in Africa. Um, and so the scale at which growth is happening is unfathomable. And you can't think about designing one-off individual things. And you also can't think about sort of having everything be designed by a kind of professional apparatus, at a certain level, you have to empower sort of society on a very wide way or sort of on a very wide basis to engage in design. And so that particular project is not only necessarily about the architecture or the digital platform or the app or these kinds of things which people can put their hands around. It's also around experimenting in terms of how do we create views of the future in the minds of the youth. Uh, in a kind of pan-African context, which is just as important as the individual artifacts. On the flip side of that, it's also about how do you involve many people in a design process? So, I mean, over 2000 people have worked on this project and we've gone through at this point three, we're into the fourth iteration of the deployable kiosk. And that kind of design kernel as a kind of blueprint that you can download 
and then go and make in your own community is an example of how you can distribute design through an open source kind of license sort of uh, process so that many people can have access to a basic ability to design to, to make something but then you have to recursively try and bring all of these experiments back into the commons so that everyone can learn from it so that's kind of testing in in a sort of miniature way something which we absolutely feel like should happen at a wider scale and we're also trying to think about how we can do this with housing is that when you have a library of, of components procedures techniques pieces of architecture um, which people can draw on and use them to put things together uh, this is one way to to think about reorienting reorienting the approach of design so i know we're getting close to the end of the time and there is a question um that i'm going to slightly rephrase from the uh from the chat which is um where how would you advise someone who might want to start in a practice that is more um you know a practice uh that would be uh um modeled in the the way in which you, you both have framed your own individual uh, practices how what would be advice in terms of how do you start like how do you even you know in part because this the way in which um what uh, the design professions work is not to move in the direction where you where where you are where you're producing super interesting work right um it's a there's the tracks are much more conventional to work with money to work with uh kind of uh, uh, known commissions to work with existing uh, infrastructures. What words of advice would you have for someone who wants to, um, in 10 years, be where you are now? I would say two really simple things. One is that um, it's not as hard as you think. And then the other one is that there's there's more of us out there than you might imagine. So I think, you know, when we were students, I think it was a very true statement to say there weren't very many firms that you could just apply to and kind of get a job in this lane of design and begin to build your, your career. It's 10 or more years later, and I think the answer has changed. I, you know, we get emails all the time from students daily asking if there is, you know, opportunity at KDI, but they're coming to us saying, you know, we heard about you from another firm like yours, or we heard about you from your colleagues that work at this firm. So I think that just like any person graduating, you look to the people or the firms and the places that are doing the work that inspires you, and you try to put yourself there through an internship, through a conversation. And then if that path isn't immediately open or available, I think there's ways to bring this mode of practice into a traditional firm. I think you can go into name your architecture firm and bring a mindset that says whether I'm working on like a parking lot detail or a, you know, sidewalk design, I, I can do that in a way that that expands what the typical sidewalk does or doesn't do, who it includes or who it excludes. And in doing that, you begin to build your own muscle for how you approach your personal practice. And then, you know, from there, you may go off and start your own firm. And then I would jump in and say, uh, you, you need to be committed to what you believe in. And maybe sometimes it's difficult to know what you believe in, especially when you're young. But if you are committed to the process and the idea that you may have, like you, we're, we're paralyzed by fear often in society and in work. But you know, our approach is kind of like, we, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into completely, but we knew we could make it work. And that's always been our approach. <laughs> um, so I think you know, we've, if you have that attitude, you can, you can stay committed and true to what you're trying to do wherever you're at. And then, you know, you can potentially see, you know, a, you know, a, a seed project, a small thing you want to take on locally um, and, a, and a, you know, attack that. And then maybe that can grow into something bigger or greater. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to be confident and not 
necessarily look back. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures, but you need to learn from them and, you know, rethink those things moving forward to, to get where you want to go. And yeah, it's a perfect place to kind of wrap up. And I want to thank um, all four of you, Ryan, DK, Joe, and Shalina, uh, for the, you know, not only the work, but also the clarity at which you've conveyed the work and the ideas and the richness and the thinking and the, the, the rethinking of the agency uh, that's fundamental to the work.